and welcome to our first service of the new year. We hope you had an amazing holiday season and that you're ready for everything God has in store for you in 2022. There's no better way to start the year off than in worship. From the start of time and creation, God's praise has been the resounding theme. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, caught a glimpse of this when he heard heaven saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. God's praise was so strong that Isaiah felt the ground beneath him shake. Heaven is still shouting God's praise today. The earth is filled with His glory and His praise still has the power to shake the ground under our feet. Day and night, He's worthy. In every season, He's worthy. The heavens declare it and the earth testifies it. He's worthy. Let's worship Him together. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Reaches me. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been parted, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn. the first 
first time I had hope Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Oh, thank you, Jesus, you have saved great to start the new year off with worshiping together. Are you new to Jubilee and interested in finding out more of who we are and what we're about? Want to meet some of our pastors and leaders and find out how to get more connected? Then Growth Track is for you. Growth Track is a three-step course that happens once a month over Zoom and step one is happening today. If you're interested in joining today's class at 2 p.m., then click the link in your chat box for more information on how to register. Prayer is often seen by some as a leisurely Christian activity, something that is available but maybe not essential or urgent. Charles Spurgeon, a great writer and preacher of the 1800s, saw it very differently. In his commentary on Psalm 11, he sees prayer as a very necessary weapon that every believer ought to leverage. The devil often whispers in our ear, flee, run to comfort, run to ease, run to whatever seems desirable at the time. Yet Spurgeon reminds us to resist the devil and he will be the one to flee. We're in a spiritual battle and there is no room or reason to retreat. There is a perfect kingdom coming and through prayer and fasting, we can see it break in here and now. What kind of miracles do you wanna see in your life, in your family, in your city, in your nation, in the world? Nothing is too big or too great for God. This is why three times a year, we devote an entire week to prayer and fasting. We take time to set aside lesser things to lay a hold of greater things by the grace of God. It starts next week, and I want to invite you to prayerfully consider how God might want to have you participate. 
We will gather as a church at each of our in-person locations as well as online, Monday through Friday from 6 to 7 p.m. and Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. We can't wait to hear stories of God breaking through and answering prayer. A new year deserves a new sermon series, and we're so excited to kick off a series called Bold Prayers, where we will look at some lofty prayers in scripture that have the power to transform your life and change the world. Now let's turn our attention to the scripture reading for today. Today's scripture reading is Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you. Uh, We are starting out the new year with a new sermon series called Bold Prayers. And we desire to be a people, to be a church uh, that is walking with God, encountering God, passionate about God. And uh, God invites us to connect with him through prayer. C.S. Lewis says that I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. And I believe that there are longings in your heart that God wants to satisfy through the power of prayer. I believe that uh, there are prayers that God wants to give you that will change your life. Prayer is the avenue which God has chosen to work through you and I. And it's because of this, it's because of this that we want to start this year out preaching into prayer. It's because of this that we orient our entire calendar for the year around gathering as a church for weeks of prayer and fasting. In fact, we're gonna have one of those weeks coming up just next Sunday, January 9th. We're gonna have our first week of prayer and fasting for the year because we believe this and we wanna be a people that prays and we wanna gather around prayer. And so next Sunday, you can participate with us. There will be resources on our website uh, that will help you uh, know how to fast and how to pray. Uh, We'll release morning devotionals throughout the week uh, for you to engage in. And at all of our locations, we will gather together. We will gather throughout the week and we will pray. And, And hopefully the hope is to pray boldly. And so I wanna invite you to participate with us in that next week. I don't know about you, but to me, I often feel aware that I should pray, that I need to pray, but sometimes I can feel in the dark with how to pray and what I should be asking for. And I remember distinctly feeling this way at one of my first job interviews out of college. I remember I had received an offer letter uh, from them and, uh, and the time off wasn't quite what I was hoping for. And my uh, wife, Daniela, was about to have our, our first daughter, about to be born. And so I was just very aware that I was gonna need some time off. And so I, wanted, I was gonna go back to my, my future employer and I was gonna give a counter offer. I remember hating it. I remember dreading it. I remember feeling like I don't know how to ask for this. Like I was pretty new into the career world, not too far removed from, from college. And I remember I didn't know if I should come in aggressive. I didn't know if I should come in, you know, really meekly. I just wasn't sure how to make the ask. 
And, and it's interesting because when you read the Bible, you see Jesus' disciples and they observe Jesus praying and interacting with his Father in heaven and asking for things. And they come to the same conclusion. In fact, they say, they say, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? Like, we don't know. You're asking for things and we don't know how to ask. We don't know how to do this. Will you teach us how to do this? And Jesus obliges and we read about it in Luke chapter 11 and that's where we're gonna, we're gonna pick up the story with this conversation, this moment that the disciples have with Jesus in, in Luke 11 and we're gonna start in verse five and this is what Jesus says to them. He says in verse five, he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Jesus lays out this scenario where someone is going to a friend because they need something. They need something. And that's fine. We all go or we should go to one another in times of need. When we need help, when we need support, we should go to one another but look at the circumstances. Consider the circumstances that Jesus has just told. I mean, really, when you read the story and you understand the context, you see the audacity that this, that this man has of going to his friend and asking for bread in the middle of the night. I mean, you've got to remember that this, okay, this is 2,000 years ago. This is uh, no electricity, right? Uh, no, one's, no one's laying awake in bed uh, in the middle of the night uh, with, uh, with lights on, you know, scrolling through Netflix shows. It doesn't happen. This is a culture and a time when, 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 when the sun went down, you went to sleep. And when the sun rose, you got up. Okay, so when, the, when Jesus says when he goes to him in the middle of the night, he's talking about in the like truly middle, dead, everyone's dead asleep. Everyone's dead asleep. His family's been asleep. And it's not like, I mean, this guy calls him friend. So unless, if he's really a friend, like he knows he's got a family. He knows he has kids. He knows they're going to be asleep. All right? He knows because this was his friend, or at least he was up to this point. Maybe not after this encounter. But apparently he decided to cash in his friendships for this one moment. Imagine if you were going to ask. I mean, imagine if you're the guy going to ask for the bread. Imagine how you would feel. Imagine the mix of guilt and shame that you must have felt, probably guilt and shame for your, your friend who has come in on a journey, who's hungry, who's needing to eat, and you have nothing for him. And then the guilt and the shame of going toward to your other friend's house, and you know you're gonna wake them up. You know you're gonna disturb them. You know you're not just ruining their night, you're ruining their day. I mean, this is a time uh, in, in history when, when most houses or a lot of houses would have just had one bedroom, with the family all sleeping together. There, you know, there was no uh, white noises keeping the children asleep in separate rooms. He knew when he woke this, his friend up, he was waking his entire household up. Must have felt guilt, must have felt shame, must have wrestled with himself, oh, should I do this? Imagine if you were the friend. Imagine how tired and angry you would be. I mean, your heart wouldn't be full of kindness. Notice he doesn't call him friend back because what friend does this to somebody? I mean, what friend knocks on your door in the middle of the night and wakes your household up? If you're a parent and you have kids, I mean, what's going through your mind is you're thinking the audacity, the audacity that this, this guy has. I mean, he probably, I mean, and that's what he says, right? He says, he says, don't bother me. Go away, ex-friend. Right? He says, don't bother me. The door's shut. My children are in bed, or at least were in bed until now. I mean, this guy is not getting into the fantasy football league next year. He's not. He's lost his friendships. But what happens as a result of this man's bold, audacious request of his friend? He receives what he needed. He receives the bread he was looking for. And check it out in verse eight, Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Jesus said he didn't give him anything. He didn't give him anything because he was his friend. He didn't give him anything out of the care and compassion and wanting to be there for him. That's not why he gave him the bread. 
This wasn't, this wasn't something given out of the kindness of his heart. This was more like a hostage negotiation. I mean, you know, you know, if you're a parent, you know when your kids keep coming out of their room and out of their room and you just want them to go to bed and you're just like, I'll give you anything, just stay in there. I mean, that's the scene that's playing out with them. And Jesus says like, he didn't get it because he was friend. He got it because he was so audacious. He was so bold. And the guy just wants to get him out. He's saying, just go, take the bread. If you just promise to not come back, take it and go. That's what's playing out here. He didn't get it. He didn't get it because he was a friend. He got it because of his impudence. Impudence means bold, audacious. I love this. Unblushingly forward. Shameless. These are the terms, these are the synonyms, these are the words that can come to mind. When you think of impudence, you think of boldness, audacious, I mean, like cringe-worthy, right? This scene that Jesus told, this is a cringe-worthy moment. And Jesus tells this order, tells this story in order, not, you know, not to say this is how it's not done. He says, this is how we should make our request to our Father in heaven. We should ask boldly. We should ask audaciously. We should ask unblushingly forward and shameless. This is how I say, that you wanna come and ask, make your request known, this is how to do it. Jesus is plainly telling us that when we pray, we should come without guilt, without shame. Guilt and shame keep us from praying. And we must choose to not let guilt and shame be the things that determine how we're going to live and how we're gonna act and especially how we're going to pray. I find that when I feel unworthy, I have a very difficult time running towards the one who is worthy of my prayers. Yet Jesus says, come on. He invites us to be a felt inconvenience. Like that's what's coming through our mind. Like when we bring our requests to God, we're like, oh, like we're just, we're just coming with all of our baggage and with all of our problems and with all of the things that we don't know what to ask for. And, and yet he says, come on, be a felt inconvenience. Come on, come pray. I mean, God is probably thinking, you could give me a thousand reasons for you not to pray. I could give you a million, but I'm saying, come on, come on and pray. This is how you approach God, boldly, audaciously, shamelessly, without guilt. The man in Jesus' story didn't receive bread because he deserved it. He didn't deserve it. It wasn't his friend's obligation to fill that need. That wasn't why he got it. He didn't, reserve, he didn't receive the bread because he deserved it. He received it because he asked for it. And this is how Jesus says we should pray. So how should we pray? Boldly and shamelessly. Boldly and shamelessly. What does God do in return? He gives us what we need. The man's traveling companions needed food and the man received bread. And then Jesus goes on further explaining, answering this question, how do we pray? And he says in verse nine, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Ask, seek, knock are words of action and they're words of persistence. And I'm just gonna work my way backwards through these, through, through these words here for a moment. When we knock on a door to alert someone that we have arrived at a house, we don't just knock once, right? We don't just go up and and wait and hope. Man, I hope they heard that. I mean, first of all, if anyone hears one knock, they're not gonna know it's a knock. They're just gonna be confused because they're gonna hear a thump. That's not how we knock. When we knock, we knock repeatedly and loudly. And if you're me, when no one answers, especially if we know the person is on the other side of the door is expecting us, we knock again. We ring the doorbell, we knock again. If they're expecting us, we, we persist. We keep, we, we persist and we do it louder and we do it more aggressively. You know, you knock on the door, it's quiet, no answer. You knock louder on the door. You're, come on, come on, we've got places to be. We've got things to do, come on. I mean, I, I, we, we, we don't knock. We don't knock once and then wait and just say, I hope, 
I hope they open the door at some point. No, no, Jesus says, come on, knock. Knock like a normal person, like knock aggressively, you know, and the door's not answered. What are we doing? And what, what are we doing in 2021? We're texting, I'm outside your door, let me in. Like we are going to get in that, the place where we belong, the place where we want to be. And that's what he says. He says, knock. He says to seek. And it helps us to put it this way when you think about something that you've lost dear to yourself. Seeking is we're intentionally, passionately seeking something. I mean, think about the last time you, you misplaced something of, of great value. Think about when you, when you lost something that you needed for that day. I mean, when you, when you looked for it, if you really needed it, when you looked for it, you didn't just look around the room that can't find it. No, if you, need, if you needed it, if it was valuable to you, no, you are looking under things and over things. You're turning furniture over. You're opening drawers. You're moving clothes. Like you are on, you are seeking that which you desire. You're seeking. And when you don't find it, you keep looking, right? When we, if we're looking for something valuable, we don't just go to one spot and say, we didn't find it and give up. No, we go to the next spot and we go to the next spot and we go to, and we keep seeking. We seek, we seek it out. So how are we to pray? We're to pray persistently. I love when you look up the definition of persistently, it says obstinate continuance. Obstinate continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty. When we say we pray persistently, we're saying we pray with obstinate, we are determined continuance in a course of action in spite of difficulty. Nothing's gonna deter us, nothing's gonna sway us. When we pray, this is how we are to pray, Jesus says. We're to pray persistently. We're to keep making our requests known to God over and over and over again and keep making them known and keep making them known. Not just ask and then go away. And that's one of the other things he says. He says, ask, right? He says, ask. All of this starts with us asking when we bring our prayers, when we bring our petitions, when we bring our requests before God, we're asking him of something. And Jesus, you should ask. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Ask and you will receive it. And when I think about the, about, when I think about the context of this passage in the way that God, Jesus is saying, you should, this is how you pray. You pray shamelessly, you pray boldly, you pray persistently. It, it just, it reminds me of how a child asks for something. And not, you know, not, not, not like a little child. Like think little child. Like I think about my, my, my four-year-old daughter, Rosie. Like when she asks for something, she asks with great impudence. She asks shamelessly, boldly, with persistence, with fixated passion, she asks for things. I can remember... I can't remember one time she came up to me. She'd been watching a cartoon and there was an advertisement that popped up and uh, it was an advertisement for this amazing toy store in New York City. And she brings me her show and she says, Daddy, I wanna go. I'm thinking she doesn't know what she's asking for. She doesn't, she doesn't understand <laughs> I mean, this is what I think. How do I answer this? Like, because I don't want to just be like, "No, we're not going." I mean, she's, I want to go, and she. And I, I think put myself in her shoes. She, she's coming to me. I'm the guy who gets stuff. Like that's. I mean, she sees like when I, if I want something, I go to you, and you make it happen. And that's as much as she understands. She doesn't understand travel. She doesn't understand time. She doesn't understand money. I mean, the other day I said to her, I said, hey, we're doing this tomorrow. And she looked at me and she said, is that yesterday or today? Okay, so I, they, there's no understanding. She doesn't operate yet on the level that I operate and that I think on things. So I, she doesn't understand. She doesn't understand that she's asking me for something in the middle of a workday with her sisters in school that actually I cannot give her. It's not within my means to give her. And I love that she sees me this way. I love that she sees me as this guy who can make things happen. When she wants something, I can make it happen. I love that she sees me that way, but it makes it difficult to explain when I can't. And so um, 
you know, I, I tried to kind of, I tried to redirect, like, hey, we can't, we can't do that. I can't take you to New York City to this toy store, but uh, we can play with this toy that you have over here in the playroom. You know, I just try to work my way, my way around it. But she was persistent. She didn't want to play with her toy in the playroom. She wanted New York City. And, uh, and honestly, I don't know how that conversation ended. I don't remember. I just remember it was going nowhere. And I remember that she was asking me something that I could not give her. Jesus says, we're the same way. We're like children, he says. And we should be like children. He encourages this. He says, come on, ask, pray, seek, over and over again, fight for it. Be aggressive about it. Be persistent about it. Be bold about it. Don't let guilt and shame distract you or or prevent you from coming in to coming towards me. Come on, pray this way. And he reminds us that so helpfully as he as he kind of brings this this passage to a close, he, he, he reminds us that we don't come to a genie in the bottle. We don't come to a God that we control, who doesn't do, just like my, I, I don't do everything my daughter asks of me. Why? Because I'm the dad, she's the kid. There's things I understand, there's things she doesn't understand. And he got, and Jesus reminds us when we pray, remember, we're coming to a father. We're coming to a good dad. In fact, we come to a perfect dad. And he says this in, he says in uh, verse uh, 11, he says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Lord's prayer starts our father. And as he teaches his disciples how to pray, he grounds it with a reminder of the relationship that we have, the special bond that we have, that he's made accessible to us. A child to a dad, not a slave to a master, not a worker to a boss, not a student to a principal, but a father, a dad. He looks at us and he says, look, Look, even if you are full of sin, full of mistakes, you who have a past and knows that you, that you have a future, that you're gonna make more mistakes, you're not gonna be perfect. You who want to give your kids good gifts. Look, you who are evil. He says, you are evil. You wanna give your kids good gifts. How much more will your father in heaven? I mean, when my daughter asked me something that's outside, my daughter asked me something that's outside of my ability to give her. But when we come to our dad in heaven, oh man, we come to a dad who has nothing out of his reach, who, who's nothing out of his ability, who nothing is impossible. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he can't change. There's nothing he can't create. There is nothing you can imagine that's too great for him. We come to a father, we come to a dad who is able to do great things. And are you living? And do you know that you have been invited by this God to come boldly and passionately and persistently to him in prayer? And I think, and I love what Jesus says because he's he's laying out for us how to pray. And then he just gives us this uh, this gold nugget of what to pray for here in in this final verse. He says in verse 13, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give uh, good gifts to those who ask him? No, he doesn't say that, does he? That's kind of the thing that you expect him to say. You expect him to say good gifts, the the way that he phrases the, the sentence. But no, what he says, he says, how much more will the heavenly father give? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. How much more will your heavenly father give you, give you more of himself? He says, I wanna give you the greatest gift. I wanna give you the source of all things. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, able to see into the hearts of men and women, to see what was in there. He was able to see past the facade, the gimmicks, the material possessions, the charming personality into the depths of our soul. And he knew that in the depths of our heart, we long, we ache, we we crave to know love. We crave for love. Peace, we crave and long for joy. We long for these things. They're woven into the fabric of our heart and there's only one being, there's only one uh, person, there's only one God who can satisfy and fill the deepest longings of our heart and it is through the Holy Spirit, it's through God himself. 
It's the gift. This is the gift. Jesus said, she said, it's better for me to go. After he was crucified and raised from the dead, he says, better for me to go so that we, so that the Father will send the helper, the Holy Spirit. This is what God wants to give you and me. This is what he wants to give us more and more of. He says, abundantly, abundantly more, he wants to give us the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The same one that was with the Father and Son in the beginning. The same one that Christ said is better for him to go so that he might come. This same Holy Spirit, it was by the spirit that Jesus worked his miracles and Jesus walked on water. And Jesus says, this spirit that I have been filled with, the father wants to give to you. He wants to give it to you. God wants to give us abundantly the thing that we need most. He doesn't want us to see us striving and working and trying to do things in our own strength, with our own intellect, with our, with our own self-awareness. No, we need to live with an awareness that there is a God bigger and greater than us. And he is so gracious and merciful. He wants to pour out his spirit on us. Imagine if we prayed this way, church. Imagine if we sought after God. What would it look like? What would it look like in your life to boldly, shamelessly, persistently ask God over and over and over again for the greatest gift of, gift of all? Because that's the great news that when we receive the Holy Spirit, it's not a one and done thing. Apostle Paul says we, we, pray, we should pray to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. There's always more. We never get to the end of him. We never run out of being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's always more to discover. There's always greater depths. And God wants to give it to us. And we can look at all these different things that we think will satisfy, that we think will satisfy this deep craving, this deep longing in our heart. But God says, no, the only thing, the only thing that will satisfy that is being filled with my spirit. When the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, entire cities were turned upside down. When the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, Miracles broke out. People were healed. The blind could see. The lame walked. When the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, revival broke out. And thousands, thousands came to know the name of Jesus. What might God do if we stopped going after things? What if we stopped going for these things that are out here, but we had a laser focus on pursuing and asking for repeatedly, boldly, audaciously? What if we had a laser focus asking God to give us more of his Holy Spirit? Jesus says he wants to give it to us. It starts today. It starts in prayer. It starts by receiving the invitation that God has given to you to come to him boldly, persistently as a child in his prayer. It's why we want to pray. And I want you to join us next week as we gather for our week of prayer and fasting because we're gonna gather and we're gonna pray boldly and we're gonna ask for God to give us more of the Holy Spirit, the very thing that he longs to give us more. And when we pray that way, we are changed. And you can be changed. And we can see our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our city changed. Come on, let's believe that. What if, what if we went after God this way? What might he do through us? Let me pray for us as we close. Jesus, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for your invitation, Lord, that you have let us come. You've allowed us to come boldly and persistently and shamelessly. All these things are to draw near to you, God. And it's today I wanna ask for myself, I wanna ask for those who are listening to this, God, that we would receive your Holy Spirit. Lord, if for the first time, for the 10th time, for the 100th time, God, we wanna receive your Spirit. We wanna be filled with your Holy Spirit, the one who changes hearts, who opens minds, God, who heals, who sets free, who saves. Oh, Holy Spirit, we need you. We long for you. Would you please fill us again today? In your name we pray, amen.